Okay, so I guess we should make a start now. So um, once again, hello everyone. Welcome to the Asia Solar Energy for Climate Change Conference. I'm your moderator for today. My name is Bonnie Ao, and it's my honor to be here today. So just to give some background about this conference, um, this is actually the first time that Carbon Care InnoLab has held a conference like this and is actually funded by the Jockey Club Charities uh, Trust. So for this session, um, given the name, uh, navigating energy crisis, paving the way for next generation green energy development. Um, we'll be exploring how we can navigate through the energy crisis through um, green energy like solar power, especially um, as uh, the global demand for energy escalates. We'll also look at green energy development from different perspectives and address the progress in different regions within Asia. So joining us today, we have three speakers. Um, starting off, we have Dr. Darren Jung, research, as, research assistant professor for the Asian Energy Studies Center at Hong Kong Baptist University. Um, we also have Mr. David Fishman, senior manager of the Lantau Group, and Mr. Fabi Tumiwa, executive director at the Institute of Essential Services Reform in Indonesia. So in a few moments, um, Dr. Darren Jerm will help us kickstart the conversation, followed by Mr. Fishman and Mr. Tumiwa. And then after that, we'll be having a brief discussion before opening up to the um, virtual floor for uh, Q&A. So before I pass on to um, Dr. Jerm, let me give a brief introduction about him. So Dr. Jerm has obtained his master's in social science from the Hong Kong University of um, Science and Technology. He also went on and completed his PhD studies in 2015 at the University of Hong Kong. So some of his research um, areas include um, multi-level dynamics in smart energy transitions and smart city development. Um, a lot of this, they take a look at from the trust and community perspective. Some of this we will hear a lot from his um, sharing in a bit. And then um, in terms of his research focus areas, much of it focuses on the East Asia region, especially uh, in Hong Kong, where Darren is based and where I'm um, based too. And also uh, very close to us is the Greater Bay Area. And also we'll be touching on other areas as well, including um, other East Asia areas like Japan. So I guess let's um, welcome Dr. Darren Jung. We'll, I'll pass the mic over to him and he'll be sharing some of his research findings looking at smart energy transitions as a new source of distrust from the perspectives on Hong Kong citizens, um, again, where we're based, uh, on the future risks of regional intercity solar energy collaboration. Okay, so um, I'll pass on to you, Dr. Darren Jern. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Bonnie. So um, uh, thank you very much, very much for your introduction. And so let me share my screen first. Oh, well, just just one second. Mm. Yep. So um, I think uh, I think you you can now uh, see my screen. So um, today uh, I'm happy to have the chance to share with you so some of our uh, research findings uh, from from a paper that we published um, last year. Uh, yeah. So um, so uh, a little bit more about myself. So uh, I'm from the Asian Energy Study Center of the Hong Kong Baptist University. So this is a paper that uh, we developed it uh, with our uh, director, Dr. Daphne Ma, now who is now uh, doing a presentation uh, in another panel panel section, I think. So, so the topic uh, that I'm going to share today is about uh, understanding smart energy transition as a new source of distrust. So I mainly focus on the citizens' perspective and also how they uh, how they manage trust and risk associating with the uh, if we talk about having more uh, connection with the regional connection uh, with uh, solar energy collaboration. So with the mainly the uh, Greater Bay Area. So uh, the first thing is that I would like um, that we will highlight. Uh, so we use the topic of uh, about um, smart energy transition. So this is one thing. <clears throat> so one thing that uh, would be uh, very closely related and very important to for for major cities, including Hong Kong, to achieve uh, carbon neutral um, by 2050. So um, most of the uh, major cities in um, in the world, uh, including Hong Kong, so they announced that so they will try to uh, achieve carbon neutral by uh, 2050 around 
China. So they announced that the country will try to achieve that by 2060, if I if I'm correct. So um, so is it important to use like uh, to employ new energy uh, to uh, new energy technology? So that will be that that that's what we call the smart energy uh, technology to uh, to try to uh, scale up and to try to better manage um, whether it's a, it is the demand side and the supply side to so energy transition in order to provide a more efficient and more effective energy management. So so that would include several things. Uh, so the one thing so um, it would that will be um, the the use of the renewable energy and and the management of our energy saving in uh, in the household level community and also in the society level so that will involve the use of a smart meters or real-time data and some um, new, new kind of policy such as a dynamic pricing policy and then to try to better manage to try to better capture so the consumption um, data um, in a more in a real-time basis and also uh, in a more in an aggregated basis and then to through the analysis of the data and then we could like uh, do a better management so uh, whether it is on the demand side and also in the supply side and the other main aspect is that so uh, we could also move on from a centralized um, energy system to a more decentralized energy system in which the uh, each household could install such as the solar panel so in your home and also the smart meters in your home so that so it is very easy for the aggregators and also for the household to understand so how much energy you are using how much energy you are generating and you have a better on Ownership, energy ownership in in the in, in the energy policy and in the energy future of your society. So so in this sense, so it is more citizen centric transition. So and in which now, um, so because citizens have a more have a better say, have more involvement in 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 the transition. Then so public acceptance and also so trust is a uh, mutual trust uh, to the policy to the policymaker and also to the uh, incumbent utilities are, are important. I think to the society, to the society, to the society, and in the smart and use transition now. So a little bit about the context of the of the Great Bay Area. So um, the Great Bay Area. So when we talk about um, energy collaboration and especially solar energy collaboration, so we have a long. Um, uh, history about uh, collaboration with uh, the Great Bay Area. So the Great Bay Area. Um, so is a. A new concept, you may say. So, uh, in the la um, given in the uh, initiated in the last decade or so. So, um, so basically before that, so we don't call it the uh, Bay Area. We have the we call the uh, Perth Delta area. So, or we call the uh, Guangdong Hong Kong area or something. So there were different names, uh, different con, uh, different names to capture the strategy that they, uh, in different periods of time, but. But having said that, so basically it is about the uh, Hong Kong and the neighboring uh, mainland China region. Uh, the collaboration between them so usually uh, so i don't have this uh, on on this slide but usually there's so uh, in terms of energy and our and and, and uh, uh, water supply so there are two major uh, initiatives that or um so over the last few decades one is about the, uh, the import of the uh, water supply from mainland china though through the dong uh, Pearl river um, so this is still ongoing and the other thing is about the development of a nuclear power plant in the Dia Bay region in the in very, which is very close to Hong Kong but not in Hong Kong so in Shenzhen in the city of Shenzhen so which is now operated um, part of the power plant is operated by the uh, uh, CLP the China Light and Power uh, uh, company power company in Hong Kong so uh, and supplying uh, sta stable uh, electricity, uh, electricity to Hong Kong citizens so these are two major uh, uh, concrete um, projects that is ongoing and has been developed uh, um, over the last uh, few decades uh, between the the, the, the Hong Kong uh, the, the Great Bay Area. So um so what, so since we have some this kind of history in the background, so so when we talk about uh, if we want to have a, a better clean energy and uh, we want to achieve carbon neutral, so uh, is there any more um, collaboration opportunities love to develop a renewable energy? So uh, through this like uh, uh, collaboration. So we're not just talking about uh, having to uh, import the uh, solar energy from um, 
from the main uh, from the Greater Bay Area. So, so since like uh, over the last um, few years, uh, I think um, the Foshan and the Zhuhai area, till they have developed uh, the renewable energy industry there. So it is talking about the hardware and also the software of the solar energy. So they have the solar panels and the solar technologies development. So they have the research center to so developed it in the Guangdong area and the Greater Greater Bay Area. So that will be very beneficial if we could like import some of these ideas and um also the products and the services to Hong Kong and then to so that I was that could be used to for Hong Kong to develop a further solar uh, development. So this is the the basic uh, context and idea behind. So that's why we 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 should uh, we 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 may consider this as an opportunity. But when we talk about opportunity and we talk about that there's something to change and to reform. So so that is about so it brings about uncertainties. So, um, so there is something new when when you have when you when you are trying to do something new, whether it is a product or services or, uh, in our know, topic of the energy system. So there will be something new that also account. So that will be accompanied by something uncertainties, and we could also understand this uh, as a risk. So, so how do you accommodate this kind of risk and uncertainties? Well, so different people have different perception. So we're talking about the public perception on the risk if we are going to do more collaboration with um, the, the, our neighbors our, in the Greater Bay Area in terms of solar energy. So there were different there were different risks. Talk about that. So there are mainly five uh, five types of risks uh, in the and in, in, in this table. Uh, the risk in the relation to SET. So there will be climate risk. Uh, okay, that could be how how you how you try to um. Uh, tackle the the extreme heat uh, events. Uh, okay, so 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 uh, or the typhoon in the in the case of typhoon. So uh, there would be environmental risk. Uh, so um, what will is there any uh environmental uh, dis uh damage uh if you do more collaboration? So how about the, the price? So the electricity price in Hong Kong is right now is quite stable. So even and so even in the context of the uh Russia-Ukrainian war. So the uh. So the, the 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 increase in electricity supply is still uh, quite mild compared to other places in the East East Asia. So um so if we do more collaboration, would there how so would, would the price fluctuate much even more uh, rigorously? So the, so that is uncertain. Uh, how about the risk in the job loss in the in the energy sector and also the data privacy? Too? So these are some of the risks that we highlighted, and then uh, and and as I I discussed that that will be included in the um. In um in my discussions and and whether you trust this party uh, that is crucial to manage the risk. So um uh, a little bit about my methodology and I won't go into details. So, so we conduct a deliberative poll with uh, one hundred seventy four uh, citizens. Uh, so we have like three sets of questionnaires, and then well we have uh, we also have on organize some small group discussion and then we transcribe them and then so mainly so these are the flow of the of the, of the of the deliberative poll. So so we 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 also poll. Um, and we also provide in between before the discussion, we also provide them. Um, so sorry, this is in Chinese. So we also provide them with a uh, free Hong Kong's uh, 2030 solar scenarios. So the first one is BAU. The second one is like moderate changes, and the third one it will be a uh, rapid changes. So basically, we try to ask them. So if we we try to develop more solar in solar and development in Hong Kong, you we use more solar energy in Hong Kong. So if BAU, then we could like do it locally. So but if we want uh, to have a more Moderate, moderate change, or we want to have a rapid change, then uh, other, so of course we have to do more um, and solar development in Hong Kong. But however, we also need to import more energy from mainland China. And then, how do you think about that? So this is the main idea behind that that we are going to ask them. And then, so this is about the basic background, uh, the background about 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 uh, our participants, and and then we are uh, so something uh some 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 major findings from the questionnaires. So we think that we ask them whether you trust about these parties in terms of their information motives and competitors, and you could see that. So basically, so our participants they trust the electricity companies, and then they have they they don't trust about the government. So whether it is the national government, provincial government, or the Hong Kong government. Okay. So um but in in, in certain sense it, it makes sense. So when you ask about uh, about the electricity supply, then of course you trust the professional and you trust the electricity companies. That is quite normal, right? But however we are talking about uh, so not just a, a relatively higher level of trust, but a, a very low level of trust among the government, then we would then then we would like to look at it, look into it. Why they don't they trust a lot in the electricity companies, but they really they seem not to trust about the government. 
So this is what we will, uh, want, want to look at. And so this is, it goes into the second finding so that we'll be able to distrust in the government motives. So, so uh, in when we talk about uh, um, doing uh, having import of more solar energy or renewable energy from, from mainland China, so what come up in the people's mind and the participants' mind? So these are some of the major things that come up. So we and we summarize uh, and then we pull out here. So. The first thing is that they talked about the Hong Kong government is are you committing? So when we talk about talk so much about importing the energy from China or the mainland China to Great Bay Area, so do are you would you prioritize in developing the local RE? So so that is one question they they ask. So are you do you have the motive to rely on more import and instead of reducing the degree of the low uh, uh the local energy autonomy? So this is about uh, the compromise. So when you try to develop more local energy, so you have a higher energy autonomy. But on the other hand, if you uh, you have more RE imports, you import more energy. So in certain degree, you lower the, the, the energy autonomy. So this is one thing that is in uh, so in, in their mind. So so what 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 is what is actually do you have an hidden agenda? So um and the first thing is about the distrust. Uh, so do you do you think about energy reliability is um so it's reliable uh, when we import uh, from the GBA. So there is also concern about the stable uh, the stable energy supply. So will be uh, sacrificed. So if we are going to do more more of this kind of uh, uh, energy import. So there are some, so I, I talk about the five um, risks that is associated with the, with the energy import. So um, the, the first thing about um, the, 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 the main focus, the prominent uh, risk, and that is talk about is the price volatility. So uh, as I said, so the price is relative, relatively stable now, but if we import more, so they they could fluctuate or not. So they concern, they, they concern a lot about the, the participants. The second thing, as I discussed, energy reliability. So they, they compare with Macau. So Macau suffered a long time of power outage during the typhoon. So because that they have like 90 more than 90 percent of the energy import from the mainland China so they also question so because there are some uh, uh, peer experience so in, in Macau so that, that uh, and the first thing is about the cost overrun so because like uh, when you develop the transmission system that could that could be um, that could the, the, the cost could overrun uh, so it happens to a lot of infrastructure projects in Hong Kong so in the last two decades so that's why they also they also question about that data privacy so so is the data uh, is there any data leakage and about environmental risk so um so if you are going to develop a lot of infrastructure for the transmission so that they also destroy the ecology so it happens a lot so when we have a lot of uh, infrastructure development in Hong Kong so so the question a lot are about so whether you concern about the ecology so uh, to, to wrap up so I know that the time so um, so, so I think I think I think I don't have enough time. So maybe is I save it for the Q and A section. But um, so, but but one thing that I want to highlight is about the poor perception of the the the, the experience from the water management from the Macau. So really damaged it, um, the trust um, um, uh, and added to the distrust to, to the government. So they, they they don't think the government is going to do a good job if they we we have a new initiative about the the REA in uh, import. So um, and also so um, so I, we have we mentioned that so there will be a series of social events that happened in uh, 2020 in the year 2020 that also uh, affect um, the image of the government and also so um, so we think that so uh, so to conclude so the public perception risk, risk is related to the public trust so uh, so if we establish this linkage how you manage the trust and how you manage uh, how you manage the risk is very important in so if you want to have a more uh, cross border or inter city or regional collaboration in energy transition okay so that's a lot uh, that I have I have shared and uh, thank you so much and uh, sorry about the the overrun. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for Dr. Darren Jern for the uh, elaborative sharing. Um, I can I think we can save our discussion for um, later when we have a moderating um, discussion. So without um, delaying further, um, let me welcome um, uh, next we have David Fishman, who is the senior manager of the Lantau Group. I'm just going to give a quick intro to him. Um, so for, for his uh, organization, the Lantau Group is actually a economic and strategic strate uh, strate strategy consulting group focused on the electricity and energy sectors in Asia and Oceania. 
And for David specifically, his work scope actually focuses a lot on mainland China. And he's actually based in Shanghai right now. So he has a lot of expertise in the Chinese electricity sector and also the power grid development. Um, specifically on solar and wind uh, project uh, bankability. And he also has a lot of expertise in areas such as power asset transaction support, uh, green power strategy and procurement, energy policy and project management. And uh, specifically his work at the Lanta Group looks at but both inbound and outbound ventures for power sectors, acquisitions, investments, and green power procurement. So um, I'm going to pass it on to um, David. He's going to share a bit about what's the energy transition scene is like in uh, China. And then he'll also provide a bit more on the uh, state of the multinational green power procurement and also some of the end user options in achieving decarbonization of power supply in the country. So I'll hand over to you, David. to unmute yourself yep oh good afternoon everyone sorry just a moment i'm uh, making sure my presentation is in pdf so i can easily share it because i see that's what the system wants me to do yes Actually, in the meantime, while we have um, David to bring up his presentation, I just want to remind our audience that if you have any questions for our fellow speakers, we just had uh, Dr. Darren Jern speaking, um, feel free to put your questions in the chat box. Um, we'll go through them in our Q&A session later. Okay, so I can see the um, presentation is up. So David, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, very good. Thanks, Bonnie. Right, so today um, I'm here to talk about what's going on in China and specifically taking a look at some of the recent developments uh, with regard to the energy sector transition and then really paying a special attention to what's happening on the corporate side of things, what multinationals are doing in China, what they're asking their supply chain to do as well in order to stay compliant with either their internal ESG uh, requirements or any type of voluntary compliance programs that they participate in. Uh, I've got I've, I've got 23 slides here. I'm not going to present all of these slides. I'm going to try to stay within my time as as well as I can. However, I'm certain to happy to take questions uh, later, and I might pull up some of those slides if I need to. Uh, a quick word on background of the Lantau Group. So we are a Hong Kong headquartered company. Lantau, of course, uh, is a reference to Lantau Island. Uh, we have offices all throughout the region. Everywhere you see a red star, we've got an office. I'm based out of our mainland Chinese office in Shanghai. Um, we can skip through some of this stuff. Just yeah, as, as Bonnie mentioned, we're working on both the developer investor lender side as well as the multinational power customer side to uh, achieve the green energy transition in an economically reasonable and sustainable way. So taking a quick look at where we stand right now uh, in 2022. So we are uh, a power sector that is still dominated by coal, despite rapid growth of wind and solar, and it has been rapid and impressive over the last six years. It's moved from about 5% of the generation mix to about 14% of the generation mix. And over the same time period, coal has slipped from 65% of the generation mix to 58%. Uh, we still have a long ways to go. Uh, however, the progress and the directionality is apparent. Uh, by 2050, you know, some far off uh, time, it seems, uh, we're anticipating getting down to something like 25% coal with a little bit of gas in there too. Uh, and then that's still 10 years away from China's carbon neutrality goal of 2060. But definitely this is the forecast, this is the vision that we see. Uh, and, and certainly of the capacity for solar and wind installs that we saw in the last year, last year and this year so far, appears to really be setting the foundation to, to make that possible. You, you can't hope to uh, reduce coal in that way unless you're building so much wind and solar uh, to replace it. So we're taking a look at the long-term decarbonization vision and, and what's happening at the same time with the carbon decarbonization is of, of course also this parallel journey 
of power market liberalization. So we have carbon reduction on the top, we have power market liberalization on the bottom, and then both of these parallel long-term goals are on top of the Energy Security Foundation. The Energy Security Foundation, uh, you know, is, is the cornerstone of everything else. If decarbonization or liberalization look like they would start to impact uh, energy security and lead to, uh, you know, it, energy insufficiency, either for industry uh, or for the private sector or for residential, uh, it could be paused. They could definitely be reformed in order to maintain energy efficiency. So important milestones to keep in mind here. Of course, we talk all the time about the 30, 60 milestones, the double carbon goals. So peaking carbon in 2030 and achieving net zero by 2060. One less publicized goal that I'd really like to also emphasize is the coal consumption peak. The coal consumption peak uh, is targeted to happen in 2025, uh, shortly before the carbon peak. Uh, so that's just a few years now uh, to cap coal consumption. And that means across both the power generation sector as well as other industrial sectors like steel and cement production. Uh, we, we do believe that power generation will be able to peak its coal consumption in the next couple years and even start decreasing over the second half of the decade. And that's going to be needed to provide some cover for sectors like steel and cement that will probably continue increasing their emissions all the way up until 2030, until that peak. Let's take a key look at what's happened in the major reforms. I know there's a lot of stuff on this slide, and so I'm going to try to talk it through it pretty reasonably. On the far left side, we see this fully regulated system. This is how we would describe the Chinese power sector for the last, uh, you know, mostly unchanged for, for, for decades even. Uh, up till about 2015, 2016, this is how it worked for just about all power customers. You had a generator. You sold your power to the grid company, either state grid or China Southern grid, at a fixed regulated rate, and then the grid company sold the power to all the power customers, also at a fixed regulated rate. And when I say all power customers, I mean residential power customers, I mean uh, commercial power customers, I mean industrial power customers. But that has started to change. We are seeing the effects of the liberalization campaign. And so as we come into the last, starting in 2015, 2016, we saw the development of a retail power market and pushing more customers into the retail power market and buying their power from a retailer instead of directly from the grid company. And so where we are now in 2023 is this hybrid model. We have market-driven customers and we have policy-driven customers. Now, policy-driven customers on the far right, that includes the residential sector, the agricultural sector, and a lot of small commercial and industrial. So small CNI uh, is delayed to move into the retail market. They're allowed to continue using grid power. However, large CNI, everybody larger than 10 kilovolts, is expected to move into the retail market and go find a power supplier, uh, a retailer, or an aggregator, or a wholesaler. These are different words for the same thing, which is a, a power utility company, somebody who sells you power, not the grid company. Uh, and that's, that's where we're moving into right now. The key point of this development is that it opens up some important new options for power customers to choose what type of power they want to use. And they can demand a certain type of power. Of course, uh, it's interesting that they have the option to demand green power. Uh, what do you get if you're not demanding green power? What do you get if you're not demanding a certain type of electricity? Well, here's a, a typical look at, say, Jiangsu province. And Jiangsu is, is quite representative of, of many industrialized coastal provinces in China. Their local capacity is mostly coal. Uh, their installed capacity and their generation is mostly coal in 2022, 2023. And they are net importers of power, Shandong, and Jiangsu and Zhejiang and Guangdong are all importers of power from other provinces. You don't know for sure what's in those imports. It varies across provinces. In Guangdong, for example, there's a lot of hydropower in those imports coming from, from Yunnan province. Uh, in, in Jiangsu or Zhejiang, it might be other stuff. Jiangsu imports some hydropower. They also import some coal from other places. Uh, but this is typically what you'd expect to find in your grid mix 
if you're not asking for any type of power specifically. You're going to be looking at a pretty carbon intensive grid mix in Jiangsu. Uh, this varies by province all over the country. Obviously, some grids are relatively quite clean. For example, the Sichuan grid has a ton of hydropower in it, and in, uh, as does, say, Qinghai, Gansu, these are all relatively clean grids compared to some of the coal-heavy grids in eastern China. So how are things moving? How are things changing? Uh, if you noticed uh, in the last slide, Jiangsu does have wind and solar in there and Jiangsu has to keep growing its wind and solar because China has implemented a renewable portfolio standard. This is also called RPS. So China has implemented an RPS for every provincial grid. So the provincial grid company needs to hit certain baseline numbers for consumption of renewables. And this is split into both hydro and non-hydro. As you can see on the left side, the provinces with the highest RPS, above 65%, almost 70% in Sichuan, Qinghai, Yunnan, these are places that have a lot of renewables. You can see it's blue in there, so it's mostly hydro, and they're mandated uh, they're mandated to have a, consume a lot because they have a lot, because they can do it. If you come down into the middle of the pack, you can see places like uh, Jiangsu or Zhejiang or Shanxi that maybe don't have as much, uh, so their targets are lower. This is maybe 25%. Uh, these are the numbers that the provincial grid company or a provincial power utility company have to be able to meet to stay compliant with the Chinese government's RPS. So right now, the RPS, the provincial level RPS, this is a major driver of consumption of renewables. And so everybody who is consuming power in any of these provinces, if you're not specifically asking for a certain percentage of renewables, you can assume that this is what you actually get. This is what you actually consume. Now, normally, you can't claim it. Normally, you can't say, I'm in Sichuan, and so I am 65% clean already. Most international compliance programs do not allow that or do not recognize you to take the grid's emissions as your own. Not yet. Uh, that might change in the future, especially as some of these percentages get really high. If Sichuan grid gets up to 90% renewables and you happen to be in Sichuan, I think it would be fair to say that you are pretty clean yourself, even if you didn't make any special effort. But that's up to your individual ESG or compliance stakeholders to decide. So let's talk about green power and brown power specifically to, to, to define it, right? Uh, we were talking about whether or not you consume green power. The grid is giving you maybe 20% green power or 15% green power. Can you claim it? Uh, well, no. According normally to those international compliance programs, as I just mentioned, like RB100, uh, they would consider that to be brown power. They would say, unless you intentionally procure green power and you receive certificates to prove that you were consuming green power, you should consider that to be brown power, regardless of what it actually is. Maybe it's mostly hydro, maybe it's mostly nuclear. Uh, normally, they will ask you to consider that to be brown power. Uh, now, of course, the grid emissions factor of different provinces is very different. Uh, here, I say the national average in China is 581 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour, that's definitely not true in every province. It's definitely not true in every grid. It will be higher or lower depending on where you are. And if you are in Sichuan, it would probably feel really unfair if you're forced to use the national average to calculate your own emissions. Uh, you might want to really focus on the local emissions and make sure you're considering an accurate starting point for yourself. Uh, green power, usually defined as wind, solar, and hydro. Uh, some companies or in some programs allow you to consider nuclear uh, being a low carbon source, although it is not a renewable source. Uh, that's fine. It really depends on what your stakeholders want to use for their definition. Uh, we do recommend that if you're going to use these and define them as green power, that you uh, try to be accurate and instead of treating them as zero uh, carbon emissions, they do have some minor emissions. Uh, generally, if you're transparent about those, I think personally it's it's more credible to be totally transparent about all embedded emissions. So I say typically under 40 grams of carbon for things like wind, solar, and hydropower per per kilowatt hour, uh, and that includes you know upstream embedded emissions and all that power consumption that any 
corporate entities are doing must be traced and provable. And these days, that means you need to hold certificates. You need to hold GECs in China, or maybe you want to have some international certificates like IREX or TIGERS. Either way, no certificates, very hard to prove, very hard to trace for your compliance entity. So how can you get GECs? How can you get green power? What's available right now in 2023? Uh, we split this up into two uh, major areas, the bundled green attributes and the unbundled green attributes. So green attributes just means the thing that's associated with the green power. It's the greenness of the green power. It proves the green power. Uh, and you want to be able to show that they're closely linked. So, you know, the top one right here, of course, this is a solar thematic conference. We've got to mention solar first. On-site generation is always a great way to get green attributes and clearly show that you own the green attributes. You look, it's on my rooftop. I consumed the power. Uh, I, I built it. I consumed it. It's my power. I prove it. I will own these certificates. And typically, MNCs, uh, multinational companies, are very happy to have have that most every compliance program very happy with that direct investment uh, the second option there also an excellent way uh, quite capital intensive though right you can put your money directly into a project uh, you can be a part owner of a renewable project uh, and then you can buy the power from your own project or at least you can show that you help to create the new project great additionality associated with that the third option, uh, we call this a green contract, or in some countries it's also called green premium or green tariffs. And this is where you work with a green retailer to say, I would like a certain percentage of renewables in my power supply. I want 10% this year, I want to go to 30% next year, and then 50%, and then 100%. And they will be responsible for sourcing the power to uh, meet your request, and they provide you with the certificates to prove that they have this green power and passed it to you. And then finally, we have this direct corporate PPA. Uh, the direct corporate PPA is just really starting in China. We only have a few case studies, uh, and it's, it's definitely in its early stages, but it is possible if you are in the same province, you might be able to find a generator who's looking for a corporate customer who you can sign a PPA with maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years, you know, you'll have to negotiate. It will be challenging, uh, but that you can also negotiate these and get green power directly from the generator, wheeling, wheeling from the grid, of course. Now, all of those are typically preferred, accepted. Those are all good from the perspective of multinational companies. Uh, they can clearly explain those options to their stakeholders, to their compliance entities. Everybody likes these. Unbundled green certificates are a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, questionable sometimes, or a little bit more problematic sometimes. They can still be excellent instruments, and in our perspective, they can in fact be very good instruments uh, to prove decarbonization as well. They just require a little bit more work to prefer to to prove that they are high quality. So the Chinese instrument is called a GEC, a Green Energy Certificate. Uh, and you can buy those either on an online platform or you can buy them uh, from the generator directly. Now, importantly, if you're buying an unbundled green certificate, you're not buying the power. You're only buying the certificate. It's a financial instrument. So you're compensating the generator for the green electricity, but somebody else actually bought the power. Somebody else actually consumed the power. Uh, as long as the entity that consumed the power doesn't claim that they consumed green energy, then it's okay. Then you can claim the green energy by buying the certificate. If they claim the green energy and you claim the green energy, you have double counting. And that's the key thing to try to avoid when you're dealing with unbundled certificates is making sure you avoid opportunities for double counting. Uh, the GECs have gone through a lot of uh, reforms in the last year especially to make it harder for them to be double counted to really improve their quality and their robustness and now we think the big is, is a pretty strong instrument and it should be acceptable for international programs uh multinational companies in in, in china have, have tried all of these strategies historically and they are still trying some of these strategies today some of the ones that we would highlight uh, of course, uh, BASF, the German chemicals company, uh, made a lot of news last year with their intention to have a 100% uh, renewable power facility down in Guangdong. They signed agreements with a couple of partners to build that new facility and then power it entirely with a 
with a, a purpose-built offshore wind facility and some other renewable assets as well. They kind of pioneered this model, and I think they're still working on it, honestly. Uh, but that would be a great example of kind of a corporate GPPA or a green PPA. Uh, something that's more common and easy for more investors to look at is this fourth one down here, LG Chem. LG Chem with their retail green PPA or retail premium, uh, where they just signed a retail uh, contract with, with a power supplier in Jiangsu to receive green energy from them. They pay a premium for the green energy and they receive the certificates to prove that they consumed green energy. So uh, looking closely at bundled, we would consider you can summarize all of the world of these bundled green attributes either through self-investing or getting them from somebody else. If you get them from somebody else, that's that first column, you can either sign a direct PPA with a generator or you have this retail green power contract with a utility company. And then if you want to self-invest, you have the option of building it on site, usually that's a smaller facility, or a direct investment into a large uh, utility scale project. And so that would be obviously a much larger capital outlay, but these are all available options, all mature options for you in China right now for green power. And then by contrast, to summarize up what's up with green power instruments, uh, especially these unbundled instruments, uh, GEX, IREX, TIGGERS, uh, all available in the market. Because the GECs have just seen some pretty significant reforms, we think they're going to become quite attractive for project owners and that they're going to be issuing more GECs and choose to issue GECs instead of IREX or TIGGERS. And as a result, we think the supply of GECs is probably going to be expanding quite rapidly in the near future and that the IREX supply is probably going to be shrinking quite a bit in the near future, uh, which will be have an interesting effect on both of their prices. Right now, GECs are quite a bit more expensive than IREX. We think that's probably going to be a gap that closes pretty rapidly, that GEX will be getting cheaper and IREX will be getting more expensive. So I know I want to be conscious of time and how uh, much or rather how little of it we have. So I'm going to wrap it up here for now. Uh, I want to skip through this. This is going to take too long to talk about. So for now, um, I'll just wrap it up here. I'll say thank you. Uh, and let you know uh, we are following and paying attention to all of this stuff all the time. Uh, China's efforts to make corporate green power procurement more uh, accessible, more easy, and more mature uh, have really ramped up in the last couple of years. We went from having almost nothing to having many options in just the space of two or three years, and it's only getting better. So on this front, we, we really have to say it's a, it's, it's a nice environment and it's a rapidly growing environment for corporate green procurement over most of the country. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much, David. Um, you've you've really painted a positive picture about you know the the scene in China in terms of the uh, energy developments and also you know the various aspects of of that. Um, so I think we'll save some of the other topics that you were going to share maybe in the later sessions in the Q and A possibly. But um, I think we should move on to um, our next speaker. Um, so who's going to be sharing um, the energy transition scene oops, <laughs> in the uh, in the Southeast Asia region. Um, so we'll be uh, joined by Mr. Fabi Tomiwa, Executive Director at the Institute for Essential Services Reform from Indonesia. Um, just a quick introduction. So IESR is an Indonesia think tank in energy um, policy and environment that advocates for the low carbon energy transition in Indonesia. So Fabi's um, background, um, he is very experienced. He has over 20 years of experience in the in the field in energy policy and um, regulation. And he has um, been wearing multiple hats in the industry, has many um, titles. Uh, it's too long to name all of them, but um, in summary, he basically has a very active role in advising the Indonesian government agencies, businesses and NGOs, multilateral development organizations on electricity, renewable energy and energy um, efficiency, as well as um, energy finance and climate change policies. So today he's going to be offering more on a, a bigger picture on the um, Southeast Asia transition uh, energy transition scene and and also you know how the dynamic goes um, with specific focus on solar energy development as well. Um, before I go to um, Mr. Tamiwa, I just want to remind our audience that um, there is a Q and A um, function in our um, 
uh, platform here. So feel free to leave your questions in the chat box and we'll get to them very soon. Um, okay, so I think it's time to hand over now to Mr. Tumiwa. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie, and good uh, af afternoon to all of you. I hope my screen can be, yes, thank you. Uh, Southeast Asia is, um, we know this is the third largest region uh, and the third uh, biggest economy in Southeast a uh, in, in Asia after India and China. So uh, Southeast Asia hosts it around 600 million uh, population where um, Indonesia is the largest country and the largest um, economy in the region. Um, so as we uh, see that Southeast Asia is a, is a, is a very much growing region uh, with the industrialization and with the economy, so does the energy demand. So uh, with the today policies, um, is it predicted that energy demand, fossil fuel import and, and carbon, um, carbon emission in Southeast Asia are set to increase. And even this give a kind of uh, a very problematic in particular for fossil fuel import. Right now, a fossil fuel is still dominant and uh, in the, uh, in the, in the um, near futures that the utilization of gas is expected to increase and um, that this give a, um, a challenge uh, to Southeast Asia countries in terms of securing gas supply. Uh, uh in the region right next however southeast asia also very rich with uh renewable energy and in the entire southeast asia countries are uh, a solar is the is the biggest sources but also biomass uh there's a couple of uh country with a quite uh, wind potentials and for Indonesia in particular, and Philippines, we are quite rich with uh, geothermal. So with that, um, actually, the Southeast Asia can transition toward uh, low carbon um, energy, even net zero emission by 2050. And it can uh, increase the renewable energy share around 19% today to around 65% by 2050. And at the same time, as the renewable energy increase, the, uh, the, the emission also uh, uh, from the, from, from, a process, uh, uh, from the energy sector can be reduced around 75%. So in, in this case, then um, renewable, energy become the primary energy sources. So we can see that there's still a couple of fossil fuels, but prime, uh, renewable energy has become primary energy uh, sources and the electrification of end use is a major driver and, uh, and encompass all energy sectors, uh, cooking, transport, and industrial processes. Uh, in 1.5 degree scenario, so this, this is based from uh, I, IRENA report, Electrification fuel switching to modern and renewable energy fuels and energy efficiency actually could reduce um, uh, quite 20% of the energy de demand re um, re relative to the, the other scenario, which is a more moderate scenario. And emission also will, uh, right now, the emission will increase in the short term because again, the consumption of fossil fuels increase in, in, in particular natural gas and uh, oil. But uh, under 1.5 scenarios, uh, they will decline by 50% below today's uh, value by 2050 and 75% under more uh, um, aggressive scenario. Next. And the good news that uh, Southeast Asia countries, they have an aspirational target to reach 23% of renewable energy uh, and 35% of renewable energy power capacity by 2025. Um, this is kind of aspirational target of Southeast Asia country. And um, uh, 
uh, right now, uh, total renewable energy cap capacity share has reached 2020. So, and it's um, has boosted by high deployment of solar PV, in particular in um, Vietnam in the last few years. Uh, also, that some of these countries have signed a global coal to clean power transition in COP26 and pledging to phase out coal plants before 2050. One of them is Indonesia. Um, but right now, solar and wind capacities in South Asia are still low. Total generation uh, in combined, uh, it's around 5%, and it, it could raise up to 11% by 2030 is based on the updated electricity plan. Um, and uh, with that, then there is a plan to add more than 50, 50 gigawatt of solar and wind capacity by 2030. You can see that in, in, the, uh, in, in Vietnam, in Thailand, in Philippines, in terms of, of uh, uh, also higher solar in Malaysia, but also wind, wind I think it's in, in um, Vietnam and Philippines that plan to add more wind power. In some country, uh, grid congestion and the ability to manage um, operate grid with higher fireable renewable energy generation is actually hampers the acceleration of uh, fireable renewable energy adoption. And we can we can see this uh, from uh, the situation in Vietnam where the grid congestion happens that curtail the high capacity of uh, solar PV that built uh, before that. So we can see that grid is very, very important in many Southeast Asia country in, to anticipate higher penetration of variable renewable energy uh, uh, in the coming years. Next. So um, solar is one of the, is the largest renewable energy sources in the region. So this, this is the um, calculation made by NREL, and it shows that under the uh, base on 2018 capex of solar project and wind project, there are more than 30, uh, 30 terawatt peak of solar project and 1.4 terawatt of a wind project with levelized cost of electricity uh, below than $150 per megawatt hour that can be developed in the region in the region. You can see that uh, 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 Vietnam and uh, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, uh, Cambodia has a potential share, also Philippines uh, in, in terms of solar. Uh, most of this uh, country has. And if we look at the declining cost of solar and wind in the last few years, this number is actually can be increased. Um, so this is very, 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 very important uh, uh, to answer the question whether Southeast Asia can rely on renewable energy alone to meet the net zero emission. So if you look only based, based on these two, te uh, two technology, we can say that yes, Southeast Asia is actually able to, to reach net zero emission depends uh, depend uh, or, um, by increasing or by uh, developing its uh, renewable energy sources. Next. So I would like to talk a little bit on Indonesia. Indonesia is the largest economy in Southeast Asia, 270 million population. We are, uh, I think, member of G20, seven largest emitters. Uh, globally right now. So um, Indonesian government has uh, pledged to, uh, in 2021, uh, to reach net zero emission by 2060 or sooner. And the government has developed a um, scenario how to reach that goal. And the current scenario that's, that's being, uh, still being um, revined, I think, and, and will turn into a legislation soon that the net zero emission strategy uh, it based on a number of uh, measures first that elect electrification is is is, is um, number one uh, second is in 
rapid deployment of renewable energy uh, is for off-grid, on-grid, and also biofuel. And right now is uh, mainly from uh, palm oil, uh, palm oil as as we uh, one of the largest palm oil producer in in the world. Um, also, uh, the government has introduced to stop building new coal plants, um, uh, especially those who are on grid, uh, owned by utilities. So uh, since since last year, um, the new coal plants is forbidden unless it's for the industry and meet a number of criteria which set by the regulation. And also explore the early retirement of existing coal uh, fleet. The uh, number four is uh, develop new energy sources like hydrogen and ammonia, green hydrogen and green ammonia, utilization of CCS and CCUS, and energy efficiencies. So the government has has planned to to uh, to to phase out all coal plants by 2050 is the latest. Of course. The detailed plans are, are still being developed right now. Um, the regulation require that in, that the, the the government develop a coal phase out roadmap that hopefully will be ready by uh, maybe by end of this year or early next year. And also, if we look at the the number of renewable energy that uh, is projected to 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 be uh, developed. Uh, um, solar PV is one of uh, is one of the highest. So in current um, net zero plan, uh, solar uh, will uh, build, uh, solar uh, PV will be built and reach around 420 gigawatt. Uh, also, at other uh, renewable energy technology, the government also aspired to build a um, uh, nuclear uh, limited to the small modular reactors, but right now it's still uh, the government has not yet issued the go nuclear decisions yet. So this is kind of um, the situation in Indonesia, and uh, the latest one that um, government also updated uh, our NBC target last year with a higher um, emission reduction target, thirty two percent. With our own effort and addition, and forty-three percent with international support. Next, so how possible uh, Southeast Asia can reach uh, net zero emission and deploy renewable energy? Well, short is not easy. There is a number of challenges that need to be resolved. First is that uh, political influence of fossil fuel and coal industry is very very strong. You can see that in a country like Indonesia, and perhaps uh, Vietnam. The uh, also uh, the second one is about coordination of intergovernmental, interministry, uh, intraministries, uh, uh, um, agencies. Right. So lack of coordination uh, in terms of planning, in terms of allocation of resources. You can we can see that a lot in Indonesia. And for making net zero emission possible, uh, this kind of coordination need to be strengthened. Uh, the third one is critical in infrastructure development in the areas of transmission and distribution uh, to evacuate forever renewable energy to load centers. And we can see that from the Vietnam case, uh, there's a boom bust of solar PV from 1916, uh, 2016 to 20, uh, 2020, and uh, the, but it's lack of tra uh, uh, transmission capacities be built in the uh, during that high. Uh, high rate growth of uh, solar um, also we see we still see that a number of conflicting policy in place um, for instance uh, fossil fuel subsidy is still pretty strong in a number of country um, uh, coal or fossil fuel get like preferred treatment in terms of pricing subsidizing fossil fuel is is, is one of them uh, so we, we see that this all the all Policy that need to be uh, need to be reformed in order to um, increase uh, rapid deployment of renewable energy. Uh, also, we see that the number of technology that being offered to the to the to the region 
for instance, um, ammonia co-firing to in, instead of coal retirement or coal phase out. CCS and CCUS technology is pretty strong, especially right now in the oil, but also to the coal plants and recently small modular nuclear reactors. Uh, because of this, um, same, some of this technology, although it's already exists, but the economics and for uh, in particular for S S SMR, this, the safety and the economics still in question, but the government already put that in the plan it is uh, it could delay uh, rapid transition to renewable energy because the utility for instance waiting for this technology to be mature and able to develop and 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 prevent rapid action in in uh, deploying um, renewable energy and the last one is actually financing uh, it is ex it is estimated that to build clean energy infrastructure southeast asia may need around 630 billion to almost uh, uh, 990 billion dollars until 2030. So it requires public and private financing, both uh, uh, both uh, domestic and international. So in this case, uh, most of Southeast Asia country must improve their uh, en environment, uh, business environment, investment to unlock uh, capital mobilization. So. These are number of challenges, but I think that um, right now, as ASEAN moving toward with more ambitious target, uh, uh, we we have seen that there is a number of policy reform. In particular, I have to say that in in Indonesia, uh, policy reform planning it's 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 uh, right now I think is very very high in the government agenda. And as Indonesia also. Uh, um, part of the or has initiated uh, just energy transition partnership started last year and um, uh, we hope that we can make breakthrough in terms of renewable energy deployment and coal retirement early coal retirement uh, through this uh, JetP initiative thank you very much thank you very much thank you so much um mr tamiwa for your um uh, sharing and it's very good to understand also you know some of these regions especially um, in Southeast Asia uh, and also specifically in Indonesia how uh, you know that they're actually seeing this quite positively and also the fact that you know they're having this on the very top of their agenda hopefully we'll be we'll be able to see more progress over the years and reaching the targets that they've set um, so so on the schedule, we're supposed to have a sort of Q&A session uh, where I'll be asking some questions to our fellow speakers. But um, given the time, and we, I do see uh, quite a few questions in the chat box, I figured maybe we'll address those first. And if there's anything else, um, I can back up with some of the ones that I have in my notes here. Um, so uh, just before I go into these questions, uh, I'll just give a last shout out to the audience. Um, if you have any last minute questions that you want to um, pose uh, to the group and also especially for uh, Mr. Um, Tumiwa since he's only just uh, did his sharing. So any questions, please put it in the chat box below. Um, so I'm going to take a look here. Um, we actually have a question for, first of all, for um, Dr. Jung. Um, so here, they're saying that um, looking back on the survey that he was sharing, um, he said that despite the rationalized findings of the views on trust of the government, um, they're asking uh, about what's the overall livability improvement to the city community. Um, because obviously with the smart transition um, term, it doesn't uh, apply only to energy or um uh, electricity supply exclusively. So um, he wants to find out um, how uh, Dr. Jair actually views on the overall social climate. So would you mind sharing a couple um, uh, points on that, Dr. Jair? For the question, so um, so uh, I try to keep my answer short. So the quick uh, answer is the overall uh, climate and uh, in terms of trust to the government is still low but maybe could be a little bit higher, possibly a little bit higher than compared to what I do in 2000, what we do in 2020. 
So um, why do I have this kind of conclusion is that um, so ongoing, we did another um, survey, so which is about a trust and smart city survey. And we asked um, sim similar questions, but not, but not in terms of a smart energy transition. So we asked um, uh, ask the participant whether you trust the government. So if they are the smart city providers and then to provide the smart city services. So could that could be anything. So uh, not, not just about smart meters. And then so whether you trust of them, uh, you trust them. And then and then we find out that so um, um, and and also we have we also conducted an, another uh, an, an, another uh, another another survey so recently so which is about uh, also about smart energy transition. So we asked them so um so if um so so your uh, so the, the data uh, so so the smart uh, the the data is um. Um, so, so we ask whether so so we have different parties in managing in managing your data so, uh, from the smart meters. So, so whether you trust them or not, we ask similar questions. So, uh, uh, in addition to the two thousand and twenty survey, so and then and then um, from the general public, so we see that so the the score for government is still very low. So we apply a similar scale. So we use zero to ten. So in the two thousand and twenty survey, and we, we use exactly the same scale. And for the for 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 the smart and city survey, and also for for the for the survey that I just mentioned about, so conducted in two thousand and twenty two, I think. So and um, so uh, over time, so we have cross sectional um, um meta analysis data, and then um we could see that so the so the the overall picture the over the overall score is still lower than five, so which is uh, in the range of um mistrust or distrust. And um, but but compared to compared to 2020, it seems to be a little bit higher. So so this is possibly because now some of the people who are discontent with the government because they migrate outside of Hong Kong already. So this is one of reason. And there are continuous like people uh, moving out and moving in. So moving in from uh, mainland China and moving out. So uh, because of uh, whatever reason or. or whatever reason, so they find it maybe a bit better place um, of retirement and a better, better place for the next generation and also um, for better uh, um, job secure uh, opportunities uh, outside Hong Kong and also um, maybe for political reasons and for whatever reason. So some people who are not, uh, who do not have a, a very strong, strong trust uh, in uh, about for the government, so I think they, uh, some of them already move out. So that could be one of the reasons so about the uh, mild uh, increase in the trust uh, level in in the government. So this is maybe my 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 main observation. Too. So and preliminary findings about so based on three surveys, uh, including the two thousand twenty, and the change in the trust in the government. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so hope that answers your question. Um, this is from Jenkin Lai, one of our um, listeners. Um, okay, so next we actually have a question for David. Um, so um, this question is a, actually there's three parts. Um, first of all, is asking what are the challenges and opportunities facing the consumers in China? Um, and then is it about pricing or accessibility? And do you see the opportunity now to speed up further the deployment of RE and the retirement of coal? So would you be able to give some inputs on that, David? Cut out for just a moment. I heard opportunities and then I missed the rest of the question. Could you, could you do it again? Yeah, sure. Um, actually, so let me let me ask you the first part of the question and I'll pose you the second part. So sure. the first part is what are the challenges and opportunities facing the consumers in China? Is it about pricing or the accessibility? Uh, depending on where you are in the country, it could be one, the other, or both, uh, or neither, actually. So in the industrialized coastal provinces, the challenge is both pricing and accessibility. So the example that I used of Jiangsu, uh, green power is scarce. Green power being scarce has also contributed to it being expensive. Uh, and as a result, uh, limited volumes that you have to pay quite a lot to try to get some of them as a corporate end user. 
by contrast, we'll take somewhere like Hubei in the central region. Uh, Hubei has plenty of volumes of renewables. Uh, if you want to enter into a green power contract, you certainly can, but it will still cost you. Uh, there's still a premium associated with that. And then the other example up in the Northeast, maybe you have a factory in Hubei. In Hubei, there's actually ample green power. You can easily enter into a green power contract. You'll pay a pretty small premium uh, for, for the green power. At certain times of the year, you might even be able to get the green power at a discount, especially in the spring when wind is really strong. So while price and scarcity are both barriers in some cases, it's it really varies by region. So thank you very much. And then the second part of the question is, um, where do you see the opportunity now to speed up further on the deployment on RE and also the retirement of coal? Um, I, I don't see, well, I think it would be very challenging to speed up the deployment of renewable energy. <laughs> uh, if you read the news, you'll see China has just broken its own record that it sent last year uh, for, you know, for, for first half of the year, wind and solar deployments. Uh, it's, uh, if it's possible to go faster, uh, I, I'd be amazed if I if I could see it. Uh, I think the 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 industry is already building very very quickly. In terms of retirement of coal, I don't think we really see much coal retirement happening in the near future. Uh, coal cannot be retired by building renewables. Uh, in general, it's just there are different types of energy. There are different qualities of electricity. So you can build so many, so many uh, wind and solar plants and still not be able to retire a single coal plant. Uh, what you can do is use them less. And that's what we are seeing right now. And every year we see China using its coal plants less and less. It adds capacity and then all of those plants get used less. So in 2022, Chinese coal plants uh, were on average something around 46% utilization rate and that keeps dropping. Uh, so, yes, there are some retirements happening. Uh, they're not retired because they're unneeded. They're retired because maybe they can't meet emissions standards or they're too small, they're too inefficient, uh, they're, they're, you know, they're targeted by the provincial government for not being up to the standard of, of uh, modern coal production. Uh, but as far as plants and retirements, I wouldn't expect to see too many retirements or even any coal plant retirements until uh, on a provincial basis, you have an energy mix that can completely replace the existing coal plants and, and maintain energy security. And like I mentioned, uh, you need a strong mix of, of wind plus solar, plus lots and lots of storage, plus maybe in some case, hydropower, pump storage, everything before you can even think about retiring or removing a coal plant from the mix, unfortunately. By contrast, something like nuclear uh, directly replaces coal. You build a nuclear plant, you can just immediately remove an equivalent sized coal plant. But uh, variable renewables can't, uh, can't quite do that without a lot of support. Right. Actually, I do have a question that might be in contrast to what the earlier question about speeding up, because I was thinking, um, given how, you know, China currently is just only recovering from the whole, you know, the post COVID recovery is kind of uh, going pretty slow. And also, um, there's a lot of, you know, geopolitical tensions and risks as well. Um, so taking those into consideration, I was wondering, you know, what's your view on, you know, their progress on, um, uh, you know, this green energy transition and whether actually it's going to be hindered by these um, factors um, instead of uh, speeding up? Because you did say earlier that, you know, they've basically topped their speed uh, on, in terms of progress. But do you think some of these factors might have hindered the progress for achieving some of these goals, you think? Um, well, in terms of geopolitics, uh, the impact of geopolitics on Chinese domestic planning uh, is, is somewhat limited in that China, uh, the speed at which China builds a certain type of energy versus a different type of energy. Uh, it's not like China doesn't have access to solar panels if there's tariffs on solar panels. You know, they're all produced here. Uh, so the geopolitics issue is, is, isn't that big of an influence 
there is, uh, of course, the economic slowdown plays a role, but it's actually the opposite role that you might think. Uh, if the economic slowdown persists through the year and maybe into the next year, what that really would imply is that uh, industrial demand drops, right? Industrial demand stagnates or drops. And if an industrial demand is weaker, it makes it easier for the new renewable additions in any given year to meet the new demand for power. Uh, if we think of the inflection point as being what is the first year that all the renewables that we're adding can actually meet 100% of all the new electricity demand in this year. Right? That's, a, that's an interesting and important thing to look at. In 2022, renewables met about 70% of China's new demand. Okay, so that meant 30% of it was met by by coal, right? Which is why coal consumption grew last year. The first year that renewables meet 100% of coal uh, 100% of new demand, that's the first year that coal consumption drops. Uh, and so we're waiting for that year. That's the inflection point. So if industrial demand is weak, it actually means maybe it's a little bit easier for that year to become the year where renewables meet 100% of power demand growth. Frankly, uh, last year last year could have been in it. Last year had a good chance of being the first year where renewables met 100% of power consumption growth. The problem was hydropower. Hydropower had a very poor year last year, and all of that missing hydropower had to be replaced by something. It was replaced by coal. And so that's how we ended up with hydropower doing poorly. It's being replaced by coal, and we still ended up with incremental increase in coal consumption last year. Now we come to 2023. 2023, uh, also hydropower not looking so great, uh, at least in the first, in the spring particularly, hydropower production was, was, was pretty poor. And that's too bad because 2023, we're building so much wind and so much solar this year. 2023 probably had a chance also to be the first year in which there's no incremental coal consumption. Uh, I, I think it will be tough now with the poor hydropower performance, but certainly it, it's, it's gonna happen either next year or the year after. Uh, if industrial production stays uh, you know, weaker, then it will happen actually faster. Interesting. The, the, you know, I, I actually didn't think about viewing it that way, but I mean, you, you definitely have a point that, you know, actually goes, the trend actually goes vice versa. Um, okay, so let me move on to the next question. There's another, there's a question for um, Fabi, uh, Mr. Tumiwa. Um, he asks, um, what challenges do you see the biggest among them? So um, you mentioned a quite a few, uh, you listed quite a few challenges. So he's asking which one is the biggest. And um, he said he was told at a huge risk for not completing coal retirement, which may be sidetracked by the so-called interim or a transitional solutions such as natu uh, natural gas, blue hydrogen or ammonia coal firing. So um, do you mind sharing a couple of your thoughts on this? What challenges do you think are the biggest? Well, there's a couple. There's not like only one. Right? Um, so if you look at uh, the challenge that I mentioned, it's very unique also country to countries. Right? And just to give you illustration from my country, Indonesia, that the, that uh, from the perspective of utility and energy planner, having high, high level of variable renewable energy like wind and solar could jeopardize the energy security and the stability of the system. I think. Um, and the, uh, uh, the utility planner are afraid that it will, uh, that the higher variable renewable energy could crack the um, the system, the energy system, the, the the power system. So this kind of belief is one of the challenge also to increase um, variable re renewable energy. Although we know that uh, building solar uh, could be very very fast in order in 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 terms of meeting this uh, renewable energy target. For instance, in in, in Indonesia we have like twenty three percent renewable target by 20, 30, uh, 25 and thirty four percent by twenty. 30 and solar could really provide this but again uh this um competent this uh, uh the competitive advantage of solar can be cannot be uh exploited because of the limitation uh and the 
and, and lack of understanding uh, from the utility planner. Uh, in many countries, I also see that uh, the interest of fossil fuel is very strong, either it's coal or natural gas or oil. I think it's, it's depends. Um, in case of Indonesia, it, uh, almost 70% of all our electricity um, uh, generated by coal. Uh, and Indonesia also largest coal producers uh, and largest coal exporter. If, um, also to a number of Southeast Asia country like uh, Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, and uh, and Thailand. Um, so the interest of of uh, keep the system going as it is uh, also serve the interest of fossil fuels, right? And um, so when when uh, we plan to do differently. To face out coal, to uh, face out fossil fuels, the resistance uh, is there. It's actually from from the coal interest, and it's not just um, big um, company, but also small company. So uh, this kind of interest is pretty pretty strong. And as we see that uh, a government also quite afraid uh, moving faster with renewable energy because. Uh, there's still belief that fossil fuel can provide reliable and cheaper electricity uh, in, in terms of the electricity, although we know that uh, it, it getting cheaper or it maintain um, the, this, this level of a cheap energy because the government pour uh, a huge subsidies into it. I, um, so this is the this is all the challenges, I think, that uh, could be very unique country by country. So I think uh, uh, um, there is no like one prime, uh, only one, but I have to say a couple of that, that um, uh, sometimes it's uh, interwined yeah, with the mm. country political system as well. Yeah, I guess it's really hard to just just pick out one because, like you said, it's all kind of connected. It all comes down to, uh, you know, one impacting the other. Um, so uh, there's a, I have another question actually for um, David. Going back to the um, progress on uh, you know China's road to decarbonization de uh, and also transitioning out of, or, or, or you know reducing the coal consumption. So you mentioned that um, it's you kind of gave a pretty positive picture that you know it's gone down from 65 percent to 58 percent and i actually have a quote here from a uh from a lead analyst at the center of research on energy and clean air um so the uh, he say she's saying that the she thinks that there's still you know because it is still 58 percent so that and there is still quite a big interest in investment in new coal power plants. So she's saying that with the massive investment in new coal power plants, um, that could create a vested interest in sticking to coal power generation for much longer than necessary. And that could mean a slowdown in a clean energy investment. So I want to, I just want to wonder, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Do you agree with the statement? Or do you have, you know, what do you think? I, I think uh, I so you're you're quoting um, Lori, right? Lori from Korea. <laughs> I was trying to avoid stands around the name because I wasn't sure the surname pronunciation, uh, but you got it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lori, Lori uh, Yudavirta is the surname. And here's a surprise for you. Lori is also a man. Lori is a man's name in Finland. Uh, so yeah, Lori is a um, is a, a longtime you know, correspondent of mine, and we talk a lot about uh, the energy sector. So yeah, I know Lori is quite concerned. Uh, about the development of coal. And, you know, he, he makes a good point there, right? Once the coal plant is built, uh, you have incentive to try to use it, right? Just saying that we're going to build the coal plant and we're not going to use it anymore, that's denying the vested interest that was that went into building the coal plant in the first place. Now, if the coal plant is built and it's not competitive versus the other types of power that are in the system, uh, 
the coal plant operator has a problem. They, you know, they need to make money, they need to be profitable. Uh, and in some cases, they are also need to be in the system at say 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. when the sun goes down and before the wind starts blowing really well, we need some coal in the system. Uh, so his concern about, or his statement that, you know, if you build the coal, now you've got this, this asset that's been built, you spent a bunch of money to build it, you're not getting much value out of it. Uh, the owner is going to want to run it as long as possible. They're going to want to use it as much as possible. They're going to push to use it as much as possible, naturally. Uh, the reality is, though, that this is a war that the coal plant operators have been slowly losing ground on for, for quite a few years. Uh, they used to have guaranteed dispatch, and then that was taken away, and they used to have uh, guaranteed operating hours and then those were taken away and more and more what I hear from coal plant owners and coal plant operators they're complaining they can't make enough money anymore that's a different problem of course you, you, if, if your coal plant operators can't make any money at all you also have a problem uh, because they're still needed to do something in the system they're needed to, to function in the system so my response to that idea in general is I, I appreciate the idea that building coal plants could also force you to, you know, th that you're incentivized to try to find a way to use the coal plant. Uh, however, I would offer as a response, you know, not necessarily that the wind, the wind and the solar is generating, it has to be used first. It's cheaper. It's, it's marginal cost is zero. It will always be used first. And then the real concern is if we're using those coal plants so little, how can we still how, how can the you know the the system still be healthy? How can the operator still be making money? Why wouldn't they just say, well, fine, if you don't want to use my coal plant, I'm just going to close it down and completely. Let's see how you like your power system now when you don't have any guaranteed dispatch. You try to try to keep a stable power system with no coal. Uh, build more batteries. I don't care. Is that going to raise your costs? Not my problem. You didn't let my coal plant operate. Right, that's the perspective that the coal plant operator is potentially dealing with, and we as power consumers have to worry about also a very practical problem. Right, uh, the answer maybe is how can we get coal generators some revenue without generating power? And so that's where we look at options like a capacity market. If China could develop a capacity market, maybe we uh, create a revenue channel where coal operators can get money for being available, but not actually burning coal, but not actually <laughs> generating power, uh, which is the, out, you know, the outcome that we want. We want them to be there when we need them, but we want to use them as little as right. possible. Right. Yeah. I guess that's also a, a challenge to be to be to, to kind of look into as well, because how, how would you how would you sustain a stable, you know, energy flow, but then you don't want to you, you want to minimize the use of coal, but then you still want them to be around if when you actually need them for you know for for the energy security reasons. So that's right. Yeah, and, and uh, when is at ten percent penetration of renewables, and you say Psh, that's you're overblowing that concern. That's not a big deal. Like, yeah, I, I get it. <laughs> when renewable penetration is at thirty percent, forty percent, fifty percent, that's the that's the future we're heading for, right? At that point, if you tell me, oh, we don't need these coal plants anymore, I go, okay, how comfortable are you with, with blackouts? Yeah, okay. So um, in fact, uh, let me end this session by um, tossing it back to um, Dr. Darren Jern, because he actually has a question for you, David. So I'm gonna actually ask him to ask the question himself, and then maybe you can address that. Um, okay. it's, it's, yep. Dr. Darren, you there? Thank you very much, Logi. Uh, so um, I just uh, want to ask a, a little bit about the state-owned uh, enterprise in China. So I, I think in your PowerPoint, in your presentation, you mentioned about uh, the, the multinational enterprises. So they have some RE initiatives, and then some have even committed to use 100% RE. If I, I, I remember correctly, then how about the state-owned enterprises? Like I know that uh, the national policy or, or even the provincial, some, there are some policies of, uh, of uh, uh, and, and also about the renewable purpose, purpose that, that is imposed on the, on the, uh, on the, on the government. 
but how about the uh, enterprises or so any compulsory or mandatory mandatory measures or is is there any uh so self initiation so that they are going to make some commitment or make some contribution to the carbon neutral uh, uh towards the 2060 thank you Yep, sure. And that, that's, that's a great question. So for the moment right now, if, if we look at Chinese industry, uh, either SOEs or private players, the only, uh, the only players who are obligated to meet the RPS are the ones that are so large that they trade power directly in the power markets, that they are a trading entity by themselves. So these are very, very large, like maybe uh, aluminum smelter or steel or petrochemical companies, something like that, right? They have to be huge, huge power consumers. Besides that, uh, right now, it's just power generation. And if we have Chinese companies that have chosen to pursue an RE100 goal, it will be because of their own sustainability goals. Uh, for example, uh, maybe some of the Chinese tech companies are very interested in a public consumer friendly brand and they might want to pursue a renewable standard. Uh, they also have to worry about their major customers. So if their major customers, you know, if you're a big supplier for BMW, BMW definitely has the requirement for you. So maybe you, you wouldn't have had this idea by yourself, but BMW forces you. So now you go to consume renewable energy. However, in the future, we will see industry added into the ETS, uh, sorry, into the, uh, into the RPS. And that's going to be starting, actually there are several provinces that are starting with this kind of pilot program. Jiangsu, for example, is one of them. Uh, and Jiangsu is going to be adding some of its top energy consuming industries into the RPS. And then they will also be required to meet the provincial RPS of you know, 15% or 25%, something like that. Uh, and that's a pilot. So if it goes well and it's implemented smoothly, we expect it will be uh, spread to more provinces and more industries. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, there are a lot more questions that I, I would like to ask, but given the time, I think we'll end the session here. So I just want to say a big thank you to all our speakers today for taking part in such a valuable conversation. Um, I hope, you know, all our audience have managed to have something new to take home and to think about. Um, so once again, thank you for tuning in. And just to mention again, this conference is organized by Carbon Care Inner Lab, and it's funded by the Jockey Club Charities Trust. Um, we have more interesting panels lined up for the next two days, so do stay tuned. And if you're interested to find out more, um, please visit the website. Um, it's www.cinnolab.org slash A-S-E-C-C-C. So thank you very much and hope to see you in the next two days. Okay, thank you.